Hello guys, Mr. Gutierrez. Thank you for watching the video. Uh, in this video, we're going to focus on uh, the mid to late 17th century, uh, new colonies entering North America, new English colonies into North America, as well as the impact those colonies had on other situations, including Native Americans and slavery, the growth of slavery towards the end of the 17th century. So for this one, uh, the objective is explain how and why various European colonies developed and expanded from 1607 to 1754. And the argument I'm going to use to elaborate upon that objective is throughout the mid to late 17th century, 1600s, new colonies were established, increasing the regional diversity of the English colonies. However, events will occur to cause conflict between religious differences, Native American land usage, and the establishment of slavery. So we're going to look into Pennsylvania, the, Carolina, the Carolinas that developed uh, in the North America as New English colonies, as well as changes to New England and also Maryland colonies as well. Also, we're going to look into the dynamic that's changing between Native Americans and the English colonists, as well as the growth of slavery that occurred uh, during the 17th century. The first thing I really want to talk about is the English Civil War. And the one thing I want you guys to really focus on with this is how do things that happen in England impact the colonies here in North America? So the colonies are not isolated necessarily about the events that are happening back in England. So if you guys remember world history, the English Civil War started uh, when James I and Charles I later on, it seemed like the fear was that they were trying to turn England Catholic. And as you recall, England is a Protestant country. Um, and also, they felt that they were taxing uh, too much, and especially without Parliament's consent. And that goes all the way back to the Magna Carta in terms of Parliament feeling that they have the power of the purse, that the king does not have absolute authority, and the king must ask the nobility for permission for increasing taxes and, you know, essentially spending more money. One thing that came out of this this uh, English Civil War was the idea of English liberty. Later on, when we talk about John Locke, John Locke's ideas were a product of the English Civil War. So this idea of English liberty and the uniqueness of that in Europe, especially since this is the same time that absolute monarchs in Spain and Louis XIV are rising the power and consolidating power up to themselves, England is a standout in this situation. They feel that they're going to have a tradition that the king does not have absolute power and that his power must be checked. So this will really be different than the rest of Europe. So how does this affect the colonies? Well, if Charles and James I are kind of uh, restoring or basically saying they want to turn England Catholic or restore a Catholic order of things, if you guys recall, Maryland was started as a Catholic colony. So Maryland was actually kind of supportive of James uh, and Charles I. However, if you also recall, the majority of the people in Maryland, especially the people that were indentured servants, are Protestant. So you have basically a violent civil war also take place in the colony of Maryland. Calvert really attempted peace. Uh, he basically installed a Protestant governor, and he adopted in 1649 an act concerning religion toleration. Uh, but this would be only Christian only. Um, there wouldn't necessarily be a lot of toleration for other religions that were not Christian. But in the 1650s, it didn't work. The Commonwealth government in England basically took control of Maryland and for a, forbidden any kind of open practice practice of Catholic religion. You also have at the same time another effect of the English Civil War, the establishment of the Navigation Acts. Now the Navigation Acts are important because this idea was that England is going to try and keep all of their colonies and wealth within the English territory, within English society, and they wanted to rival the Dutch when it came to trade. So they only allowed colonial trade to English ships and ports. We're going to have to keep this in mind in terms of navigation acts later on because when we talk about uh, rising disagreement in the colonies, uh, 
Part of that is going to be because of the sugar acts, and the sugar acts are going to, later on in the 18th century, are going to reinforce the navigation acts, especially with how much smuggling is going on in Boston. Uh, John Hancock will be one of those smugglers. We'll talk about that later. Next, I want to talk about the Carolinas that were established in 1663. One of the reasons why they were established is because England wanted them as a buffer between Spanish Florida. Remember, Spain's still in the picture here, and they have a colony, or they control Florida at this time. The colonists that first started here in Carolina would be an offshoot of colonists in Barbados, in the, in the middle of the Atlantic. Um, one of the things they first did when they first got to the Carolinas, though, was start trading with Native Americans. Native Americans were really interested in the guns that Europeans had. And so for trade for guns, the people that started the Carolinas colony were interested in furs, much similar to the France and what we call Canada today, but also captives to be sold in slaves. We're talking about Native Americans being sold in slavery. So the Native Americans that were trading with these colonists in the Carolinas would go further into territory, capture other Native Americans, and sell those to the, the colonists in the Carolinas in exchange for guns. So this really encouraged uh, the Creek, Savannah, and Yamasee uh, to enslave about 10,000 Florida Indians because they would raid into Spanish Florida and capture Native Americans, there, Native Americans of Florida to be sold in slavery. So you have this trade going on between Native Americans and the Carolinas. Indian slaves were exported from Charleston um, just in the same way that African slaves were exported out of Africa. The Europeans would tap into both slave markets. In 1715, though, the Amasean Creek rebelled against the English colonists here in the Carolinas because they were falling into debt with the Carolinas. Uh, they were defeated ultimately and enslaved themselves and others fled into Spanish Florida. One of the things they wanted to establish here in the Carolinas was kind of a feudal society. However, that would change because in order to attract settlers, English settlers, remember the English Civil War, they felt like they have rights as Englishmen. So the Carolinas would actually establish an elected assembly. They would establish the idea of religious toleration, and they would have a more generous head right system compared to Maryland and Virginia they would have 150 acres for each member of the family and 100 acres uh, for each indentured servant. Remember, the indentured servant didn't receive those acres. The person bringing them over would receive those acres. So in terms of the headright system and land, it was much more generous compared to Virginia and uh, Maryland, the other southern colonies. But the other thing that starts to get develop here is uh, slavery. Slavery actually becomes more entrenched in the Carolinas than it does in uh, Virginia and Maryland. Uh, they also brought with them from Barbados. Remember, Barbados is a sugar plantation colony and a strict form of slavery. So that strict form of slavery would also come with them from Barbados. In the law, you would have written this idea of absolute power and authority over slaves. Also, this allowed some that arrived from Barbados large amounts of land because with every person they brought with them, they would get more land. So the more slaves you had, the more land you get. Later, rice cultivation would actually become part of the Carolinas and would make slavery the epicenter of mainland slavery would exist here in the Carolinas, along with the most wealthiest elite in the South. Next, let's focus on New York. In 1664, you have the Anglo and Dutch War, where the Netherlands and England go to war with each other. The winner would be England. And the Dutch were actually more concerned with Africa, Asia, and South America. Remember uh, earlier, New Amsterdam was kind of like a backwater for them. They weren't really that interested in securing New Amsterdam. So they were really willing to give that up. So Charles II gave this territory to his younger brother, James, the Duke of York, hence the name New York. England would increase population from 9,000 to 20,000 by 1685 when they take over. Because remember, the Dutch weren't really interested in it, so England was, so the population would go up. Some of the changes that England brought with New Amsterdam, though, is that they wanted to recognize Dutch tolerance and contribute to trade. They understood that this idea that allowing for di diversity contributed to the economic success of uh, the Netherlands, the Dutch. So in order, in the terms of surrender, 
they basically allowed, England actually allowed, respect for religious beliefs and property holdings of ethnic communities in New York. So you have a little bit more toleration there in New York compared to the other English colonies. But some things ended. If you recall, the Dutch actually had more freedom for women and blacks or slaves in some cases in Amsterdam, but the English did not. So they ended the Dutch tradition of women conducting business and owning property. Essentially, the male of the family would now be sole uh, person in charge of property and business. And you actually had more restrictions towards blacks or freemen in this case. And the English start expelling skilled blacks from jobs here in New Amsterdam. The other thing that happened in New York is elites would rule. Uh, they continued the practice, the Dutch practice, of granting land to favorites in society. By 1700, 2 million acres of land were owned just by five New York families. These families intermarried with each other and had huge, huge influence of power in New York. At the same time, remember the effects of the English Civil War and English society. They feel like they have to have liberties and freedom, so you have the Charter of Liberties, uh, that were granted here in 1683. They agreed that the male property, property owners and freemen would have elections every three years. They also agreed in trial by jury, again, the long tradition of the Magna Carta, and you actually had the security of property, the idea of property ownership being a right, and you also have the continuation of religious toleration. Next, let's talk about William Penn and the starting of Pennsylvania in 1681. William Penn's father actually lent money to King Charles II, so Charles II had a debt to the Penn family. The way he absolved his debt was granting him uh, this colony. But the unique thing about William Penn also was that he was a Quaker. Now, to understand the idea of Quakers, it was actually called the Society of Friends. But other people called it Quakers. They felt they were quaking, I guess, in the name of religion. But Quakers were also really persecuted. In fact, people in New England uh, persecuted them so much, some of them were hung for their religious beliefs. Uh, so basically, when, he, when they got this land, they felt that they can exercise freedom of religion in this territory. It would be part of the West Jersey concessions, um, the elected assembly with broad suffrage, and you had religious liberty as part of that government structure here. He hoped to create a society of farmers, not large found, uh, not excuse me, not large landowners like in Virginia and like we just talked about in the Carolinas. So the main thing that the Quakers really emphasize here was equality of all persons, including women and blacks and Indians. For the time period, this was really progressive. This was really. Uh, most people, most English colonists didn't think this way at the time. They were the first group of whites in English society that rejected slavery. Um, they felt that if land was to get procured from Native Americans, that it was to be purchased. They believed this so much that sometimes they even purchased land twice if the land was disputed amongst different Native American groups. They were staunch pacifists. There wouldn't be a militia in Pennsylvania until the 1740s. There were some limitations, though, to this idea of equality. Jews were barred from office. You had to require an oath to believe in the divinity of Jesus Christ to hold office, which left Jews out. They did have strict moral codes. They prohibited swearing, drunkenness, adultery, and lewd forms of entertainment. But despite that, Pennsylvania was very attractive. All People from all over Europe came over to Pennsylvania because it was so free of society. You actually had really easy land ownership requirements, which made the eligibility to vote more open to more people because it was so easy to own land and the requirements to vote were a lot less in terms of that land ownership. This attracted people also that did not share the values of Quaker society, and that would have also a negative impact on Native Americans when you have further immigrants going into western Pennsylvania. Also, people, former indentured servants, started to move into Pennsylvania instead of Virginia and Maryland, which caused a shortage of labor in places like Maryland and Virginia, which would help cause the increase of slavery. 
So the, the unintended consequence of Pennsylvania being free is you have shortage of labor in the South. And even though Quakers did not like slavery, the inadvertent effect would it, it would actually cause more slavery to increase in the South because Pennsylvania is attracting labor. Let's shift gears for a second and talk about what changes were occurring to New England in the mid to late 17th century. Um, New England, remember, started around 1630, the Massachusetts Bay Colony around 1630. And so over the course of 30 years or so, you have individuals, the children and the grandchildren of the original founders, becoming less interested in religion and more interested in trade and business. Uh, Massachusetts Bay Colony is turning out to be a very uh, lucrative and business-focused area. So essentially, if you guys recall, in order to be full members of society and vote, you had to be a full member of the church. But because the children and grandchildren are less interested in it, they're not really becoming church members and congregationalists like the generation prior. So you have this idea of the halfway covenant, where they said, if you are the descendant of one of the original colonists, um, then you could be a member of the church and society. So this is limiting how many people can actually vote and participate within English society, and they're worried that that limitation will increase over time. Um, the older generation was very angry at the inner generation. Ironically enough, though, because of that Puritan work ethic, that's actually one of the things that contributed to how well this colony is doing, and more people are focusing on commercial success rather than religion, but was part of that Puritan work ethic that the founders had originally started. So trade and uh, merchant trade is actually going to increase in this colony. Towards the end of the 17th century, you have the most dramatic warfare between the people of New England and Native Americans that take place. Um, Medicom, or otherwise known by the people of New England, King Philip, this would be called King Philip's War in 1675. Um, the white population did outnumber Native Americans, but Indians attacked half of New England's 90 towns. Uh, New England colonists would be pushed back all the way to the coastline. Um, the Iroquois would actually remain loyal to the colonists and would help and this would actually help them later on in dealing with the governor of New York because of their alliance with uh, the colonists. Colonial and Indians would actually beat the rebellion, though. Medicom would be captured and executed. Villages were destroyed. Men, women, and children would be sold in slavery. So Native Americans, again, would be sold in slavery by the people of New England. And there were atrocities actually committed on both sides, uh, but this actually cemented the idea that Native Americans were savages to the people of New England. But the other thing that happened, too, as a result of this war, is this now opened up even more land west to the people of New England and no opposition by regional Native Americans. New England wouldn't be the only colony that would undergo change during the 1600s. Uh, you have colonies along Chesapeake, especially Virginia, that would actually start seeing less and less use of indentured services labor and the increasing use of slavery towards the end of the 1600s. Let's discuss real quick the development of American slavery. Slavery would slowly begin to be associated with race towards the end of the 1600s. A slave skin color would mark them as a society for bondage, a visible sign of being considered unworthy and unequal in society. Compared to the West Indies, though, and Barbados, slavery, slavery would slowly develop in uh, the mainland colonies. During the 17th century, the 1600s, race was actually less rigid in the beginning. Chesapeake, Virginia, Maryland, free blacks could sue and testify in court. Anthony Johnson, a slave, actually obtained freedom by the 1640s and actually owned slaves himself with several acres of land. Uh, black slaves and white indigenous servants labored together, as pictured here above me, and ran away together and sometimes had intimate relationships because they got to know each other in the fields as work and laborers. So you have this weird thing happen in the early 1600s as indentured servants and slaves worked side by side with each other. Race wasn't necessarily a factor in that situation. But you actually see laws start getting put on the books that distinguish race in terms of a limitation. 
Um, the 1620s, blacks could not be in the militia in Virginia. Uh, sexual relations between races were more severely punished than other relationships that would occur between whites. So if for some reason you had a legal sexual activity between whites, if it was an interracial issue, that would actually face harder punishment. In the 1660s, uh, Virginia wanted to elevate the standard of indentured servants to make Virginia more attractive to people from England because by the mid-1600s, Virginia had a reputation of having a high death toll on indentured servants. So they wanted to change that. So they wanted to treat indentured servants a little bit better to attract more people from England. But the effect of that would be because indentured servants were treated better, slaves are treated worse or rather not treated as well as indentured servants. So now you're starting to see a difference between indentured servants and black slaves. In 1662, any uh, offspring of a mixed race relationship, they would automatically take on the race of the mother. The consequence of this is this would actually increase the amount of sexual abuse black slaves would face at the hands of their white masters because the offspring of that relationship would be considered black, would be considered a slave, therefore increasing the wealth and property of white slave owners. In 1667, even if a slave converted Christianity, they would not be allowed to be set free. The early ideas of slavery and the early justification of slavery was the idea that, oh, they're not Christians, we can enslave them. But now in Virginia in 1667, even if they converted to Christianity, that would not be justification for free to slave. And by 1680, essentially ideas of racial difference were becoming the law of the land. Another thing that will have a huge effect in terms of increasing slavery in Virginia will be Bacon's Rebellion in 1676. So just to give you a little background on what Bacon's Rebellion was, Indentured servants are angry because of lack of land availability, and they want to move further west into Virginia, land that's occupied by Native Americans. If you recall, Maryland had a more generous uh, system to give indentured servants land, but Virginia, those indentured servants weren't really receiving land at the end of their contract. So you have a large amount of poverty among whites in Virginia, and remember, the vote was for landowners. So if these indentured servants don't have any land, they cannot vote. So power was also taken away from them, if you will, because of their lack of land ownership. You have Governor William Berkeley at the time, and he was kind of corrupt. He awarded huge land grants to the wealthiest families of Virginia. And he also wanted to maintain peaceful relationship with Native Americans because he had a deer, deer skin trade with them. And he did not want to upset that trade with Native Americans in the West. Settlers demanded removal of Native Americans to open up land for themselves. So you have the beginnings of a series of Indian massacres perpetuated by these former indentured servants. And this grew, grew into an all-out rebellion against the governor of uh, Berkeley. Nathaniel Bacon, the namesake of Bacon's Rebellion, he wasn't actually an indentured servant. He was actually wealthy. But because he advocated for taking land away Native Americans, a lot of former indentured servants came to his side against Governor Berkeley. It took a squadron of warships from England to actually put down this rebellion. The effect of this, though, is, is going to have an effect on slavery. You have basically the leadership of Virginia feel like indentured servants are causing more and more problems, especially when they demand more and more land. So let's go ahead and stop bringing over indentured servants. And you also remember a lot of these former indentured servants are moving to places like Pennsylvania instead. So what's the decision that's made? Let's bring in more African slaves. The other thing that's factoring in this too as well is the late 1600s is not the same as the early 1600s. If you recall the early 1600s, the likelihood that you die in Virginia was very high. In the late 1600s, that's not really happening anymore. People are living longer in the late 1600s. It's a healthier situation in Virginia now. Therefore, investing in slaves might be more worthwhile. So this is increasing the likelihood that slavery starts taking place. And you can actually see on the chart here, 1676, you have a, di a divergence between white indentured servants and slavery. 
So slavery started to increase while indentured servitude after 1676 and Bacon's Rebellion is starting to decrease. So these are going to be changes that are going to start to occur uh, in the late 1600s. And in the 1700s, we'll talk about later, slavery explodes in the South. It increases dramatically. And that begins here around 1676 in Virginia. In closing, the 1600s, we'll, have, we'll see a growth in diversity among colonial life ranging from New York to the Carolinas. You also have changes in England, like the English Civil War, and have major effects on Maryland. Native Americans will see further loss of territory in all regions due to English colonization. The beginning of slavery and racial differences also developed during the century. And in the next video, we'll explore the changes that occurred during the 17th century that affected colonial society and culture. Thank you for watching, and thank you for your time.